gotten a lot of uh, questions and messages from people asking me if I was going to talk about any of the WWE programming that's been airing the last few weeks on A&E. So I just want to take a few minutes here just to talk about uh, some of the stuff that I've seen. I did watch uh, the biographies on Stone Cold Steve Austin and Rowdy Roddy Piper. I briefly mentioned the Austin uh, documentary, the biography last week. I didn't have much more to say about it because, you know, as with the Piper one, there really wasn't a whole lot of new ground. You know, if, if you're a hardcore wrestling fan, you pretty much know the story. You've seen the DVD documentaries for Piper and Austin uh, that WWE has done. You know, the A&E ones, they're done in partnership with WWE. So anything overly controversial, they're not going to cover it or they're going to cover it in their own way because they're in bed with WWE. So again, you're not really breaking much in the way of new ground. You know, that said, I think they're well done. I, I enjoyed watching both of them. Uh, the next one is Randy Savage. The Macho Man documentary premieres uh, tonight. It's every Sunday night. Then there's a uh, Booker T biography, and they have other ones slated for The Ultimate Warrior. Gee, I wonder how much of that one they'll whitewash. Mick Foley, Bret Hart, and Shawn Michaels are all getting the uh, A&E biography treatment. The Piper one, you know... They had this, uh, I don't know if you can call it an outtake or what, but, you know, Vince McMahon is one of the people that is interviewed for these. And they recorded this little segment with him, I guess, as they were preparing to interview him in his office. Where Vince has his uh, cell phone, his smartphone in his hand, and he's having this pretend conversation. It's as if Piper is calling him on his phone. And he's talking about it like Piper is, you know, how's, how's the weather down there? Like Piper's in hell. And he's having this conversation with himself. And it's like, oh, Piper's saying, oh, we're saving a spot for you. And Vince is like, well, I'm not ready yet. And he's going through this whole thing. And then he ends the conversation and he starts laughing, like, you know, yucking it up. Like, ah, ah, ah. And he goes, oh, Roddy's not in hell. Roddy's in heaven. Like he was just joking. What a bizarre joke. What a weird person. Like, I could just imagine Piper's family sitting down, getting ready to watch this, and they aired this. This was just something they filmed that they probably looked at and go, oh, this is so fucking weird, we have to air this. It's just bizarre. But anyway, but Vince is a bizarre guy, so I guess I shouldn't be really uh, surprised by that. Yeah, the Piper one, like the Austin one, was really good. I guess the one thing I, I was not aware of... Um... When they talk about Piper right before his death, you know, because he died, he had a heart attack, I think, in his sleep, and uh, passed away, I think it was in 2015, I believe. A few days before he, he died, he was on the Rich Eisen show in studio, and they did air some clips from that interview, and his family and his kids were talking about how it, it, the interview set off a lot of alarm bells, because if you watch it, Piper is just clearly not in a good way. He is stammering and stuttering over his words. He's losing his train of thought. It's not the typical Roddy Piper that you would see in an interview. And they knew something was wrong. And that was only a few days before he died. And the night before he died, his wife, Kitty, is interviewed as well. And his wife said that they were going to go to the doctor the next day. She had talked to him and they said, okay, we're going to the doctor the next day to get you checked out, to see what's going on. He agreed to go, and that was the night that he he passed away. And she was grateful. She was very emotional, obviously, but she said she was grateful that he died at home, in bed with her, because so often he was on the road. Even that late in his life, he was still traveling and doing interviews and TV shows and movie cameos and wrestling appearances and convention appearances. And so much of his life was spent on the road that could have easily happened. He could have died alone in a hotel room like so many other wrestlers that we've heard about over the years and so many of his friends and his colleagues. And it just so happened that he was at home with his wife. And so that's the one thing that she said she was grateful for. So I didn't, I, I must have seen the interview at some point, uh, but having watched the clips of it here, I didn't realize when you really watch and listen to it, yeah, there's definitely something off about him in that interview. And I didn't realize that. And I didn't realize that he had died, whatever it was, you know, two, three, four days after that. Uh, so that's something new, I guess, that I that I did learn. 
One common theme so far in the first couple of these is how these guys, how much these guys put the business and their work before their families. And they were barely home. And they were not father of the year. Piper tried to be, uh, more so Austin, and he admits it. He was not a good father. He basically, is only now in his life, is trying to uh, repair and form relationships with his daughters uh, that he just didn't have. You know, when he had the divorce with his wife, Jeannie, she moved, you know, to, uh, or she went to England. I think as he uh, explained, this is around the time of 9-11, so they weren't able to come back to the States so uh, so quickly. And he remembers one day having a conversation on the phone with one of his daughters. And his daughter had the Southern Texas accent that he has before that. But when he talked to her on the phone, she had a like a British accent. And he said he broke down after that phone call because it just kind of hit him. Like, wow. Like, I don't even know my own kids. They're, they're just, you know, they have this totally different life overseas, and I don't have any kind of real knowledge of what's going on with my children. So at least he's, you know, he's self-aware about it. At least he admits it. But man, it's, it's, these guys are not going to win Father of the Year. And it also hit me that 30 years from now, the documentaries on this current era of stars, by comparison, are going to be boring as shit. <laughs> oh my God. But don't get me wrong. You know, I'm glad that a lot of these guys are probably, hopefully, going to live to a ripe old age without their hearts exploding at 50 or dropping dead in their hotel room at 40. We can leave those days behind. And the stories of guys being on the road 300 days a year and never seeing their families, there have been a lot of positive changes. But those stories from 30, 40 years ago, coming up in the territory days and all the crazy shit those guys were doing, and back at a time when more people believed if you were a heel, you'd have to fight for your life just to get back to the dressing room without being hit with a battery, or having urine thrown on you, or being stabbed, or attacked in some way, which is horrible. But those days, I mean, those days are long gone, you know, and it just... It, you have to say, it does make for a more interesting story than someone who basically grew up in WWE, which is a lot, the case with a lot of these guys. What's the Baron Corbin documentary going to look like in 30 years? Can you imagine that? What it was like coming up at the Performance Center? Oh yeah, how, what, what, an <laughs> what, an exciting, what an exciting story that'll be, you know? What's the most controversial thing they'll be able to cover? Something they tweeted? Creative didn't use me properly. These documentaries are going to be a bore. I'm telling you right now. Now, the other show that's been airing on A&E, again, working in tandem with WWE to produce this show called WWE's Most Wanted Treasures. Now, I like it because I'm, I'm into stuff like this. It, it, the basic concept, it's almost like their version of uh, I said porn stars. Uh, <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very different show. That would not be airing on A&E. Pawn Stars. It's kind of like that. And they have this guy. It's basically a, it's a scripted reality show. It is 100% a scripted reality show. As most reality television is. AJ Francis is a former NFL star. I think he played for the Giants actually. Now he's been training for the last year. Year and a half. At the WWE Performance Center. So he's training to become a WWE star. But they have him as one of the, uh, the the stars. He's one of the hosts of the show. He's he's one of the wrestling nerds who is uh, you know like like me and probably a lot of you, who's into this kind of stuff. Who's into the memorabilia and you know collecting shit. So the premise of each episode is you know on behalf of of Triple H, who is sending AJ out there to find some of these items that they want to collect and bring in house bring back in-house to WWE. Uh, AJ will go out with a, a particular wrestler to try to collect some of their own memorabilia. They obviously have a lead on who has it and where it is. It's not lost. It's not lost treasures. They know exactly where this shit is. But the premise is to convince this fan or whoever is in possession of it to give it up or to sell it. What do you want for it? 
and Triple H is on the show. Stephanie McMahon is on the show. Uh, it's it's weird a little bit seeing these you know, legendary figures go up to uh, you know this random fan's house, ring the doorbell, walk into their man cave, and say, "Hey, you've got my uh, piece of gum that I <laughs> that I chewed. I'd like to uh, I'd like to buy it back from you." I don't know. It's a little it's a little strange as these guys venture out and try to get back their old uh, their old stuff. But the first episode had uh, Mick Foley. And Foley with, you know, AJ Francis, he goes out. And he's looking for a few different things. He's looking for an original Mr. Sacco. He's looking for the original Mankind uh, shirt or vest that he wore when he made his debut. One of the fans that they uh, run into, they go to this person's house. He is a huge collector of Cactus Jack memorabilia. So he's a huge Mick Foley fan, huge Cactus Jack fan. And they find that he has a ring-worn Cactus Jack flannel vest. And Foley tries it on and if, you know, he's like, "Yep, this is this is official." He goes, "It's it's signed. This is the real deal." And they go, "Well, look, we want to we want to buy it from you." And the guy's like, "Yeah, no, I can't give that up. It's like a crown jewel of my collection." So they offer him $2,500 for it, this used ring-worn vest. Uh, he says no. So they up the offer to $3,500. He says no. And you know what? Good for him. You might think, whoa, the guy's nuts. $3,500, bucks. take the money. You underestimate the money people are willing to spend on rare pieces of memorabilia and rare artifacts, whether it's at auction or on eBay or whatever, people are willing to spend top dollar. And as time goes on, if you, you know, there's only going to be a handful of ring-worn items like this. And especially as these guys get older and they start to die off, you're going to find that a lot of this stuff is going to shoot up in value. So it kind of sounds crazy, but you know what? It's really not. He said no to the offer. So Foley promises him a tour of the WWE warehouse in Connecticut. And they have this very phony scene where they, you know, him and AJ go outside the house and they FaceTime Triple H and Ben Brown, who's the official uh, archivist there for them, who, who runs the whole warehouse. And Foley's like, well, you know, I kind of sort of promised this guy, you know, that I would give him a tour and Triple H... The whole thing is so fake. But anyway, they convince the guy, okay, yeah, that's that sounds good. Maybe if I go get a tour, maybe there's if I see something I like, maybe we could do an even exchange. And they give this guy a tour. And by the way, if you're like a long, long-term WWE fan and you're into this kind of stuff, that that place is like the holy grail. I can only imagine the kind of shit they've got in there. I would love to get a tour. If they gave tours of the warehouse. And had, like, at the very end of your tour, they had, like, a little store that, you know, even if it wasn't the official items, they they almost created, like, copycat versions that you can buy or something. I'd be the first person there. <laughs> I will readily admit, I'd be all over a tour like that. But this guy's getting the grand tour, and they're in a room, and he looks over, and he goes, oh. And he finds what is the 2 by 4 Wrapped in barbed wire. And I don't know if it was the one wrapped in the real barbed wire or the one wrapped in the rubber-tipped barbed wire. Because if you watch the uh, street fight with Triple H and Cactus Jack at the Royal Rumble in 2000, they had a real one. And there's clearly a moment where it gets hidden under one of the announce desks. Later on, they go to retrieve it. And that's the the rubber tipped one. So I don't know which one it was, but apparently it's it's one of the 2 by 4s that were used in that match. So again, pretty rare stuff. And the guy is standing there, and it must have been the rubber tipped one because the guy the guy's got the bat in his hand. He's stroking this barbed wire 2 by 4 And he goes, "I'll tell you what. I'll give you the cactus jack vest in exchange for this and then throw 2500 bucks in there on top of that." And Ben, the uh, Ben, the archivist says, "You got a deal. I want to cultivate a relationship with you." They shake on it and they make the deal. So they got the vest. 
this guy gets to take home a barbed wire wrapped two by four, which I'm sure was just great on, on his commute home. <laughs> go, go, going home with that. Hey, honey, look what I got. So that was uh, that was that. And then uh, there's a different part of the episode where Foley, uh, you know, he, he reenacts the Mr. McMahon hospital scene where Sacco debuted. He surprises Vince McMahon. Stephanie McMahon is telling Mick, okay, we're going to surprise my father in his office. And it's this whole scene with Vince and he's, you know, acting the part. Whatever. The second episode I thought was way more interesting. The second episode had Undertaker and Kane featured. And some of the cool stuff, you know, they go to, so so this guy AJ is with Undertaker and they go to Kane's house. They go to Mayor Kane's house. And Kane goes into his uh, basement or attic or garage, whatever it was. And he's, he's saved up some stuff. He's got boxes of memorabilia from his career. And he's looking and he finds a box that has his old Unibomb gear. From Smoky Mountain, which I I think he also wore that same gear in Puerto Rico when he was playing a different character. It's uh, the character he played right before he came to WWE as Isaac Yankum. And it's the same Unibomb mask and, and gear that he wore for the very first match he ever had against The Undertaker. It's the match that got him noticed. It's the match that it was good enough that when Undertaker went back to uh, WWE, you know, after doing the match, he said, you guys, you got to sign this guy. This is a guy that I can work with. So he actually had the one and only Unibomb uh, outfit, which, again, he sold. He did agree to sell that to uh, back to WWE. He found an original Kane mask, tried it on and everything. And the thing was, they weren't sure if it was the original Kane mask from when he debuted at, at Bad Blood. So they have this one scene where the, the guys back at the warehouse, they're analyzing it. They're studying it. They're studying the patterns of the stripes on the mask and the stitching. And they determined that it was, in fact, not the original mask. It was likely mask number two that he would have used probably sometime early in 98. And so uh, that got sold to uh, WWE. Then there's the Paul Bear Betrayal Urn. The urn that Paul Bear used to turn on The Undertaker at SummerSlam in 1996. When he aligned with Mankind, he whacked Undertaker in the head with the urn. That was the Boiler Room Brawl. Paul Bear, many years ago, he gifted that urn. They were trying to find, where is this urn? And it turns out he gifted the urn to a funeral director who I guess had written him a fan letter many years earlier. And Paul just showed up at the guy's funeral home one day with this urn in a, in a velvet bag. He goes, here, I got a gift for you. And it's been sitting in the National Museum of Funeral History in Houston, Texas for all these years. Just like in a glass case with some other memorabilia that they have, non-wrestling memorabilia. So they find it. And Undertaker is shocked because he goes, look, I, I lived in Houston my whole life practically. I never even knew this place existed. And they go to the funeral museum, and the guy is very, you could tell, he's very hesitant to give it up. He goes, well, we'll have to have a conversation with the director of the museum. It's not really my decision to make. So they meet with this woman, and you know, clearly this urn is very important to this guy. But it's a, I'm, I'm like, I'm watching this going, here's Undertaker after this career that he has had. He is sitting in the middle of this funeral museum, you know, in this negotiating session negotiating over a random urn that he got bonked in the head with you know 25 years ago i don't know just just the ridiculousness of uh of the entire like he gives a shit i mean come on please but they convinced them and so they got the betrayal urn and uh the coolest thing was undertaker decided okay i'm gonna go through my storage unit see what else i can find in there for you and he's going through these bins in his storage unit and he finds, he didn't even know it was in there. He finds the Phantom of the Opera mask that was custom made for him at the end of uh, 95. After Mabel had fractured his orbital socket, he came back probably earlier than he should have. And they had this mask custom made to protect his face for a few months. He didn't wear it for very long. He had the mask the entire time, didn't even know it was there. So he agreed to donate that to uh, WWE, and he found a box with the purple Undertaker gear 
that he debuted at SummerSlam in 94. Purple Undertaker. And he had him, AJ had him tried on. And uh, Undertaker said, well, this, this may hang off on me a little bit. I used to be a little bit heavier than I am now. And he tried on the old Undertaker purple gear. Which, again, I think he also uh, donated to them. So tonight is, I guess, uh, Jerry Lawler is going to be in the episode tonight. I, I enjoy it. I, I think it's, uh, you know, like a fun little show. And all of this, I think, is just building to an eventual WWE brick-and-mortar Hall of Fame. You know, Triple H has talked about this just recently. Vince McMahon is not sold on there being a Hall of Fame. He says Vince McMahon just doesn't think Hall of Fames make money. And he may be right. It could be one of those things where, you know, there's only so many wrestling fans. When you go to the Hall of Fame, like if you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Or you go to the NHL, the Hockey Hall of Fame, which I've been to. I'm not even a big hockey fan. I've been to the Hockey Hall of Fame when I was in, uh, I was on a trip to Toronto many years ago. How many times are you going to go back to that place when you've already gone there once? I don't care how big of a fan you are. I've been to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. I've been there twice. I didn't have any interest in going back after the first time. Not because I didn't like it, but it was like I saw everything there was to see. I only went a second time because it was like a family trip. Once you go to these places once, you are very unlikely, I think, to go back unless you build a Hall of Fame within a, a, a building that you can have and host other events, whether it's matches, signings, Q&As, I mean, whatever it might be. It would have to be like a big complex that's just more than a museum. So I'm not, I don't even think Vince McMahon is wrong. I can understand where he's coming from. He looks at it as a money loser. As a fan, they've got to have a physical Hall of Fame at some point. I think Triple H is dying to do it. I think uh, there's going to be one in what he's doing in the meantime, because Vince doesn't give a fuck about any of this stuff. This is Triple H. I, I do believe that he does care about this stuff. He's been collecting robes and old belts and stuff for years now. He collected stuff from Flair and Bruno, I think Harley Race, with the idea that one day he'll be able to share this more than just once a year at Fan Access. So I do think there'll be a Hall of Fame building one day. It just might not be while uh, Vince McMahon is uh, in charge and among the living. But I do think that is what this is uh, building to. Now, speaking of shows on, uh, not on Vice, or uh, I'm sorry, not on A&E, but on Vice, uh, Dark Side of the Ring, Season 3, premieres this Thursday on Vice TV. So uh, you know what that means. The reviews are coming back to the podcast. I know you guys enjoyed the ones I did for the first two seasons. That is either going to be on uh, Sound Off 703 next week. Or if I don't have enough time to fit it in with the history stuff, which I probably won't, uh, I might just post them directly uh, to the YouTube channel. So wherever they land, I will be doing reviews for each episode of Dark Side of the Ring. The first one this week, it's a two-parter, two-hour episode on the life of Brian Pillman. Part one is already up. I am not watching it. I want to watch the whole thing in full on Thursday. But if you want to watch part one, the first 45 minutes are already up for free on the Vice TV YouTube channel and on their website for the uh, Pillman episode. So it should be good. I'm looking forward to it.